Great Lakes ports, harbors, and marinas. These webinars are initiative of the Ohio State University Climate Change Outreach Team, a multi-departmental effort within the university led by OSU Extension, Ohio Sea Grant, and six other OSU departments to help localize the climate change issue for Ohioans and Great Lakes residents. I am Frank Lickkoffler from the Ohio Sea, sea Grant Extension and joining me today are two speakers who will discuss how a changing climate could impact our ports from a regional perspective. Dale Bergeron, a Maritime Extension Educator from Minnesota Sea Grant, and Jean Clark, a Coastal Engineering Specialist from Wisconsin Sea Grant. They will be discussing a regional project about climate change impacts funded by NOAA and the Great Lakes Sea Grant Network. We are very excited to have both of them here to discuss this work today. But before we do that, we have a few logistical, logistical aspects to, as we get started. During our presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Afterwards, at about 1240, we will conduct a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during the pres presentation, please feel free to use the chat feature located on the right-hand side of your screen, and I'll collect and pose your questions to Dale and Jean at the end of the, their presentation. We'll have more than 200 participants on this we webinar. This is a great okay. diverse group representing governmental agencies, academia, and nonprofit groups from the Great Lakes and around the country. Feel free to keep those questions coming throughout the presentations, and we will have a great question and answer session. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted onto our website for later viewing. Also, we will post a webinar survey in the chat feature toward the end of the hour. Please take a few minutes after the webinar to fill out the survey. It will help us continue to bring you better webinars. Without any further, further delay, I would like to introduce Dale Bergeron and Jean Clark, who will present economic implications of climate change impacts to Great Lakes ports, harbors, and marinas. Dale and Jean. Thank you, Frank, for the introductions. Uh, if we could have the PowerPoint, please. Actually, Dale, uh, you already you have it, so you can just go right to it. Uh, we don't see it on our screen, so uh, we're kind of con confused about that. Okay, oh, let me uh, let me just take the ball right back, and I will get it onto the presentation. I'll give you the ball right back then. Okay, okay. give me give me a second. Okay, well we'll jump right into this. Go ahead, go ahead, Jean. Can everybody hear us? Excellent. Okay, well, one of the things that we want to do is we want you to be engaged and, uh, and enthusiastic. Uh, and so to do that, we decided we're going to give everybody who can answer a particular question $1,000 at the end of the, uh, uh, the presentation. So obviously I'm just kidding. However, I got your attention. And that's really the essence of what we're going to try to do today. We're, we're going to use the Esperanto of dollars to help make visible the potential impacts of climate variation on the Great Lakes communities um, and activities by illuminating the current value of vulnerable port and marina infrastructure and then intimating the potential liability and or opportunity that uh, could be realized in attempting to adapt to climate change. And with that, I'll turn it back to Gene. Thanks, Dale. The topic today will actually summarize one portion of our Great Lakes Network SARP grant. That's the NOAA Sectorial Applications Research Program. In fact, Dave Liebel discussed the same program at the previous webinar. The title of it is given in the middle of the slide, but to simplify it for today's webinar would be something like, what global climate change issues are applicable to Great Lakes ports, harbors, and marinas, and how can we prepare for those potential impacts? And note that there are many partners of this grant, many NOAA partners from the Great Lakes Sea Grant, uh, as well as Sea Grant Great Lakes Network. The grant itself has five, five specific objectives those range from climate change modeling, trying to bring global climate change aspects down to the Great Lakes region, uh, impact, economic impacts for ports, harbors, and marinas, which will be the focus of Dale and my discussion today, uh, geospatial tools being prepared for 
for several ports and harbors to get a visualization of the impacts, in particular water level changes, a number of communications products, as well as all of the network partners integrating the results of our work into our strategic planning. The major objectives of our presentation today will be to talk about our case study results of Ports Harbor uh, and Marina's attitudes and awareness towards climate change, to talk a little bit about the relevant climate change issues for Great Lakes ports that we've identified, to discuss the economic tool development to try to evaluate those impact ranges on ports, harbors, and marinas, show how those tools and methodologies can be used on two case studies, and then talk about how the approach of using the tool or matrix or the methodology could be applied for other applications. Thanks, Gene. Um, historically, we know that the environmental, social, and economic systems in the Great Lakes are highly sensitive to even minor changes in weather patterns, ice cover, and water levels, impacting everything from wetlands to maritime commerce. In the Great Lakes Basin, even relatively minor climactic variation can produce profound impacts on a multitude of systems and activities. In this respect, the Great Lakes sensitivity to climate variation is unique. It's sort of like the bird in the coal mine, serving as an early indicator of potential environmental, social, and economic issues that all of us worldwide will become uh, uh, victims and or beneficiaries of as climate change continues. There's a general consensus among scientists that understanding specific potential threats and opportunities due to climate variation and planning adaptive strategies to these changes is essential. In addition, to create behavioral change, we need to communicate vulnerability and opportunity with a value statement, uh, one that stakeholders understand and accept as a basis for specific action and investment. And, um, in this project, uh, we tried to take a look at the broad impacts and general concerns related to climate variation in the Great Lakes. Very little work exists evaluating the costs that could be incurred due to climate-induced change on local resources, structures, and systems. This is in part due to the climate modeler's inability to supply dependable microclimate modeling information on which to make predictions. Uh, in addition, we have difficulty in communications because of the time frames involved, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the future. Today there are, in the Great Lakes, on the U.S. side alone, there are 130 coastal cities and towns with federal navigation projects that include channels for navigation and structures like breakwaters and piers, although originally authorized to safeguard navigation and maritime commerce, um, the federal harbors and federal harbors from ice and waves, these navigation structures also provide critical flood and storm protection for public and private buildings, for roads, facilities that uh, have developed in the shadow of these resources along the urban waterfront, and in some cases things like power plants, water, genera water uh, supply systems, and wastewater treatment facilities. And so over half of these structures currently um, were built prior to World War I, and over 80% of them are older than their typical 50-year design life. So they're particularly vulnerable, and that's why we wanted to take a, look, uh, uh, take a look at them. We currently have 610 miles of channels in the Great Lakes, 117 harbors that are federally um, uh, serviced by the Corps of Engineers. That's 104 miles of breakwaters. And just as an example, at, at somewhere between five and $10,000 a lineal foot for breakwaters, and of course that's going to vary on depth and size and a variety of other issues, but let's take an average of $6,000 uh, $6, a lineal foot. You're talking about a $3.3 billion investment just in breakwaters. And we also have 20 dredge disposal facilities that may be, have values between $20 and $35 million each. Uh, we also have the locks at Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, and we have locks in Chicago, Illinois, and Buffalo, New York. Um, 
excuse me as I point myself with the slides here. So climate change adaptation is what we're really looking at here. And it's fairly obvious. When it's cold, put on a coat. When it's hot, sit in the shade. Uh, I posted the official description. But when this program ends, I want you to remember three basic things. Um, if we're going to deal with climate change and climate adaptation, we have to realize that something is frequently better than nothing. So as we engage our stakeholders, we have to meet them where they are. That's really an important issue. And we have to listen and understand their value propositions. Why are they interested? What's going to make them engaged? Um, one of the things that we chose to avoid was the discussion of what is causing climate change. For those individuals that are interested primarily in mitigation, that might be frustrating. But as soon as we move into that area, we deal with political issues. By simply admitting that the paleoclimactic record shows that climate change is a regular occurrence uh, on the Earth's surface and that we're in a stage of climate change, um, we can skip the issue, at least temporarily, about why and focus completely on what do we need to consider and how are we going to adapt. And that was our goal. Um, also, dealing with climate change is perhaps the wickedest of wicked problems. Um, it's not going to be solved, and so we have to implement adaptive management strategies, and that can't occur till we have a fully engaged and educated populace to work with. Coastal communities are certainly the most vulnerable to climate change, and we went about doing some real basic things. We created a survey element uh, tool to, uh, to assess where people were when we began the program. Uh, we supplied them with that again at the end of the program to see what kind of change occurred. And in the middle, we met with specific stakeholder groups uh, to discuss their understanding of elements of climate change and implement, uh, the implic implications on operations, facilities, procedures, et cetera. Um, so when we talk about climate change, the first thing that we realized was that there are climate drivers and there are climate indicators. And while modelers and professionals in climate uh, prediction deal with issues like radiation and ambient temperature, particulate matter, atmospheric makeup, that is the composition of gases, and on and on and on, um, the climate indicators or the weather outcomes and impacts is what our stakeholder groups need to understand. And so, for example, precipitation events, what is their number, their duration, their degree, the phase, are they water, ice, snow? And so we shared some of those um, concepts with our stakeholder group initially to get their perceptions and to um, acquaint them uh, with a terminology that we could all use. And from there, we talked about water level fluctuation, increased storm intensity, increased sedimentation, and ice cover and length of ice cover. And certainly, there'll be winners and losers in the Great Lakes, and we're aware of that. So. After all of our discussion, we had to ask the question, what's at risk? What are the opportunities? We didn't list that one here on this slide, but that's certainly an, uh, a reality. What is the current value of the systems we're concerned with? Now, this could, in our case, is uh, the vertical faces that support um, protection and access within port and harbor communities. Um, but it could easily be wastewater facilities it could easily be a variety of other systems that support access or, or uh, services within a community. So what future opportunity exists, what future liability exists, and who stands to gain or lose? Because that's who's going to be engaged and that's who's going to invest. And so the idea was to develop a matrix, and I'm going to uh, turn it over to Gene to explain what that matrix was all about. Thank you, Dale. Well, the majority of the Great Lakes ports, harbors, and marinas 
impacts or secondary impacts. So we chose to, to focus on the two most likely primary impacts, those being dredging volumes may increase. And why would that happen? That would happen when water levels decrease, and so dredging would need to happen. Or if the storm intensity were to increase in the watershed and increase sedimentation, both of those would drive dredging up. We also want to focus on damage to infrastructure and how might that occur. Damage would occur if water levels went down and the wooden structures would tend to rot, as you see in the photo on the right, greater than if the water levels were higher. Uh, freeze and thaw could affect rock quality and crack breakwaters. And storm damage, if the storms were greater, uh, inferior infrastructure may be damaged, and so we want to know how, how to cost that. The grant goals were to develop tools that could be used Great Lakes wide they were meant to be qualitative and, if possible, at least start being quantitative or at least as much as possible. Listed on the slide are some of our knowns or, in some cases, unknowns. The modeling isn't completed yet, so we don't know the water level variations, whether they'll be up or down in one foot, two foot, or more. We do know that the infrastructure damage can be highly variable with regards to the type of infrastructure and its condition. We want the tools to allow for regional variability. We also want the tools to allow for inf infrastructure variability and for the many different types of infrastructure that ports, harbors, and marinas would use, and then to apply those to two case studies, with the result being tools and methodologies that we can apply with unknowns at this time. We searched for and selected two Great Lakes-wide databases. On the left is the core, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers dredging database that contains archival contract information for all of the core dredging projects in the Great Lakes. On the right is the Great Lakes Maritime Research Information Clearinghouse webpage front that's held at the, at the University of Toledo. And this website contains just a large amount of port facility-wise information that we could use for our infrastructure matrix determination. So for the dredging tool, we took the Army Corps of Engineers database, which goes from 1993 through 2009, and separated it into three regions. And those regions correspond to the three core districts, Detroit, Detroit District, Chicago District, and the Buffalo District, in an attempt to see if there is a regionality difference in the dredging costs. We then subdivided each region into commercial ports or harbors and recreational ports and harbors. This gives us a size difference. The commercial harbors typically dredge hundreds of thousands of cubic yards of material whereas the recreational harbors are very small and sometimes just tens of thousands. So we may see difference in costs there. We then sorted each of those databases by port, listing the most recent dredging contracts and chronologically first and the older later. So with this, we had our dredging cost tool for the federal channels, but not the slips. For the infrastructure, that was a lot harder. This is a matrix development. So we, we developed a matrix to reflect what would be the structure costs in dollars per foot in versus different depth ranges to get the ranges of cost estimates for the structures. We utilize seven data sources ranging from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers contract division as well as uh, national consultants and Great Lakes-wide consultants, uh, coastal engineering firms, and dredging consultants. The list, or, list of major assumptions were that we weren't going to include design, permitting, or site investigation costs because they would vary port-wide or port-wise and would have to be added depending on which port you're looking at, which could easily be 25% or more of the numbers. 
The replacement values in the matrix, as you'll see, assume minimal top ground work. So what we are looking at are the vertical faces only, those that would be damaged due to water level changes or storms, which means that we aren't considering any of the top structures, which could over, would easily override the cost of the structure damage, such as a grain elevator or a coal unloader or cranes. They're not included at all, and the ports would have to infer would those be damaged or need to be replaced or not. The costs you'll see are June 2010 estimates based on the U.S. Army Corps of Engineer cost index. And as I said, there are many variables not accounted for these ranges. So the results are going to be very conservative. They'll be the minimum costs, and you would build on from there. But they will provide a first good estimate to quantify the cost numbers. And this is the infrastructure matrix actually divided into two parts. On the left, you'll see the entrance structures, where there's 11 different types of structures, more typically found in the Great Lakes. And on the right-hand side of the slide, the interior structures. These are the slip-type structures that we normally see. We then subdivided each of these matrices into three different depth categories shallow, medium, and deep, because the construction methods may be changed uh, depending on the depths. We also subdivided each into whether new structures had to be built or just rehabilitation and rehab. So that's why there's so many different categories and so many different cost ranges. And finally, we also noted the situations where when a structure had to be replaced, it normally would not be replaced with the same type of structure, but something newer. Uh, case in point would be the early turn of the century deep water timber crib structures that the armies would build. The army would would build with concrete caps. Nowadays would be replaced with steel sheet piling, so there wouldn't be a number in there. So with that, we have the infrastructure cost matrix. The best way to show how these would be used is I'll walk quickly through the Duluth Superior case study approach and show how these tools and matrices can be used. I just want to add a note that um, the data sets that we used were a great start, but we had to go to our port community and ask them to evaluate what was there and then even go further to private um, dock owners and ask what was there. And maybe you want to comment briefly on that? That happened in both cases, both the Duluth Superior case study and the Toledo case study. Both the dredging numbers were incomplete, as well as the dock facility numbers had to be added to. And so hopefully one of the outcomes here will be that we'll understand the importance of creating baseline information and then continuously updating that information to stay current and accurate from port to port. And this could be not only a, a port issue, but it could be, again, stormwater, wastewater folks are going to need to do this same kind of thing. Okay, so for the Duluth Superior case, we find that there were 58 different port facilities, and we had to get the important features for all of those. We categorized the types of structures into the same type of structures that were in the matrix, so we could utilize those costs and then estimate both repair and replacement costs for each because we don't know the condition of those, and that would have to be determined. Then we went to the dredging portion and first estimated the cost for the entire federal entrance or the, the entire federal authorized channel cost per foot. We also then had to estimate the cost for dredging the slips, which are typically done privately, and they're a function of the vessel that would would go to that slip. So we had to talk to the port owners and see whether a regular ocean-going vessel, typically 75 feet wide or so, may frequent those slips, or the large carriers with a thousand five foot wide and make variations uh, accordingly. So for the Duluth Superior Harbor, on the left-hand side, you see the 58 different facilities that come out of the 
database from the University of Toledo. And on the right is just a particular example of one facility within the Duluth Superior Harbor, the dock details and the physical characteristics. I've highlighted in red the type of characteristics that we had to then pull out of the database. And these vary from the berthable length of the slip, the slip depth, the wall height above the water, because it's not just the depth for the wall. To replace the wall, we need to know the total length of the wall. And with this, we can then go to the structure database and begin to estimate what it would cost to repair or re rehabilitate that. So in a simple Excel spreadsheet, we've taken the data that we needed, reduced it, and put it for each of the facilities and then can singularly calculate the new replacement cost or the repair replacement cost for each facility. And here you see an example circled in the numbers for a steel sheet pile bulkhead with a concrete cap for the BNSF ore dock and the new and repair cost. And then do this for all 58 docks sum them, and we have the totals for what would be the infrastructure damage costs and what would we have to pay to either replace them or at least rehabilitate them. For the dredging costs, we can go back to the, the Corps of Engineers database, and at least for the Federal Harbor, we can look at what were the typical dredging costs for the most recent years. And if you look in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see numbers somewhere on the order of $12 per cubic yard or so. So that's what we chose. We then take the entire cross-sectional area of the federal authorized channel, per, uh, change that to cubic yards per foot of depth, multiplied by the $12 per cubic yard, which was the number just chosen based on the database. And we see that if we were to lose a water level such that we had to dredge, let's say, even one foot more of depth of the entire harbor channel, it would be on the order of $37.6 million. Now, now, clearly, there's not enough capacity to do that, and it would have to be staged, but it gives an idea for how valuable that channel is and how costly it would be the water levels were to change. For the costs for the dredging of the individual slips, we then go back to the structure database, assume the type of vessel that would berth there, add a factor of 1.2 it was arbitrarily chosen to allow for maneuverability and connection to the main channel, but not dredging the entire slip. And since this is typically done privately and in much smaller volumes, we calculated it for a series of numbers, five cubic yards, or five dollars a cubic yard, 10, and 15. Did the same for all 58 slips. Then we could summarize for the entire Duluth Superior Harbor. For the dredging costs of all the slips for three different scenarios of five, 10, and 15 dollars per foot or per, per cubic yard, for the slips, plus the federal, the entire federal channel at $12 per cubic yard, we see ranges of from 39 to almost $42 million. And what this points out is that even though five, 10, or $15 per cubic yard, what we see a small change in the total number, and that's because the federal channel quantities overwhelm the quantities needed to be dredged even for 58 slips. Infrastructure costs, repair and replacement. We're looking at for simple repair, and it's not simple, when we're getting 30, 35 feet of water, it's almost replacement. But we're looking at numbers on the order of $177 million to almost $300 million for a total replacement of all those slips. And again, this is just the vertical faces of the structure. For the Toledo Harbor, I just have two slides that show the Toledo Harbor is much smaller. It has 28 slips involved or facilities, 
and the entrance or the federal authorized channel is less. So you can run through, use the same tools, the same methodology, and in this case, we, we, come, we arrive with numbers on the order of 11 to $12 million to dredge all of the slips in all of the federal authorized channel, and for the infrastructure costs or value, vary from $72 million to maybe $123 million or so. So what we have are first cut quantifiable numbers which would clearly rise depending on the condition of the infrastructure and the number of feet that would need to be dredged. Just moving on, so tools like this could be certainly built or derived for other types of applications. And one particular application would be for stormwater infrastructure. You could look at variants of, of conveyance structures and detention and retention ponds, pumping cap capabilities or capacities and outlet structures, and how those sizes would vary depending upon storm variability. So if you had estimates of increases of storm intensities, you could start using the methodology to determine when and how much it would cost to modify those infrastructures. The tools that we, we came up with could also be used in conjunction with the federal infrastructure assessments. This is a program that is ongoing where the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers are costing their entrance structures and would like to know what are the public and private investments protected by those structures. And so the interior structure information that we've calculated combined with the exterior from the federal infrastructure assessments could then give an order of magnitude for the investments protected. Um, so basically the results from these kinds of tools, whether they be port community focused or whether they be stormwater uh, infrastructure or a variety of other structure types um, can help put communities on notice um, about the need to support and plan for continued functionality. The majority of port communities have little or no understanding of the value, costs, and opportunities related to maritime transportation in their ports. These tools uh, can provide information for a starting point for discussions and uh, a place where groups can rally around trying to understand not only what their choices are, but what their uh, costs may be. We tend to oversimplify is one of the things that we found out. There will be complex interrelationships between the impacts and the outcomes um, related to environmental change. Uh, we don't know and can't consider issues outside of our areas of interest or expertise. So when we talk to business folks, they're thinking within their frame of reference, and that frame of reference may not only be an industry, an industry focus, but it probably is also a business timeline. And the variety of uh, length of timeline depends on uh, budget cycles, which can be a year, two years, five years, 10 years, 50 or 100 years. And very few businesses go out more than two years. So it's a very frightening situation. The integrity of not only physical structures, but economic, social, and environmental systems are all at risk due to climate change. We didn't really talk about um, operations and um, uh, the impacts of seasonal changes and shifts. We didn't talk about um, equipment issues and training issues, but all of these are going to focus in uh, and be a problem as well. Our goal was to start to create tools to make visible something that we've all wanted for some time. And as the National Academies panel has said, we want to describe, analyze, and assess actions and strategies to reduce vulnerability, increase adaptive capacity, improve resilience, and promote successful adaptation to climate change. But we need those tools, and they need to be specific. Terms and word choice matter. Um, we have so many issues here to deal with. We need to stay focused on what we know and try to communicate honestly to our stakeholder groups the difference between risk and uncertainty. It's a very complicated situation. Um, 
we want certainty. We, we want to know when we react that there's going to be a particular outcome, but it's not always uh, something we have uh, options for. Um, risk basically is an unknown outcome, but we know the underlying distribution. Uncertainty, we don't know that distribution. In other words, one is an objective probability where the other one is a very subjective probability. And that's where we find ourselves with uh, microclimate modeling right now, with an inability to look um, at a level where actual planning needs to take place. So intellectual honesty requires us to try to define risk and uncertainty and communicate that to our stakeholders. And indeed, if anything, for the science community and the education community and the planning communities, uh, credibility is our currency. And we need to be cautious and careful and honest about what we know and what we don't know. And a good place uh, to begin for getting people's attention is the economic impact on specific known elements. Um, some take-home points. Meet your stakeholders where they are. Be honest about the degree of uncertainty that you're dealing with. Absent specific projections, develop an awareness of the current opportunity and potential liability. Again, we created a scalable tool so that it doesn't matter if they tell us the water goes up or down, we're going to be able to use that tool and relate it to other resources. For example, our particular uh, assessment can be linked to the U.S. Uh, Army Corps' um, port by port assessment of current uh, structure life cycle. So they're going from port to port right now and evaluating what is the current condition of these ports and, and key elements in those ports. We need to understand the potential benefits, costs, and risks associated with a range of climate impacts. And again, scalable tools. We need to define necessary partnerships because who's going to pay for this? The reality is that we're going to uh, have to change the way we evaluate the building of new structures and the repair of older structures. We're, uh, in the past, engineers essentially drove by looking in the rearview mirror. You'd look backwards 100 years to find out how you'd build. Today we find we have to look forward 100 years. And so uh, to convince people to spend money that they may not have for a future we can't uh, predict for sure is a very frustrating element. And communities will be in competition uh, to both be prepared and not overspend. We need to recognize where we are today and that we have choices. And if we can do that, we're beginning to take uh, the appropriate steps uh, to address climate change through uh, reasonable strategies towards adaptation and mitigation. And hopefully we have some questions and comments out there. Gene, any last comments? No, I think you've covered it well. We'll see you with the questions. All right, great. We'll look forward to that first question. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, we've got some really interesting questions uh, during the presentation, so uh, let me get to start and ask Dale and Gene as many as we can. Uh, what questions they can answer today by, by 1 o'clock will get posted later on on the website with their answers. Uh, so you can go to the website and, and uh, get these. Um, how did you guys decide, other than because you live up in Duluth, uh, picking Toledo and, and, and uh, uh, Duluth Superior Harbors for the, this study, for the case study? What, what was in those harbors that made you uh, pick those guys? Well, starting with Duluth Superior, where we're located, it's the 15th largest tonnage port in the United States. A lot of people don't realize that. And the largest port in the Great Lakes. And so um, it's a sophisticated um, uh, patchwork of business activities, maritime interests, um, energy products move through the port. It's one of the largest coal facilities um, in, in North America and the most productive single uh, loading terminal in North America. Um, and we have massive um, uh, resources for iron ore. We have, obviously, it's a huge um, bi-state. It's both Duluth, uh, Minnesota, and Superior, Wisconsin. It's a joint harbor. And uh, so it made perfect sense to take a look at it. And as you heard from Gene, with um, uh, 
58 different uh, elements to review, it was quite a challenge. Um, Toledo, on the other hand, was a little uh, easier to grasp and um, quite different. You want to talk about that difference? Right. We all, Toledo was chosen as well because of their dredging issues. We knew that while they wouldn't have as many facilities that we have up here, they dredge much more than we do in the Duluth Superior Harbor. So for them, the dredging information was, was really important. And knowing that just having to dredge another foot was much more likely than having to replace all of their 28 structures or so. So we tried to get a variation of, of a large port with a lot of slips and a lot, and a lot uh, of federally authorized channel, and then one that was somewhat smaller but still a commercial harbor with major dredging issues. Also, I'll add something that we didn't really talk about during the presentation, because obviously we were trying to put an elephant into a soup can here today. But um, you know, this whole thing was designed to be the matrix itself uh, was designed to work all the way across the Great Lakes in any of the Great Lakes. And not only would it work for commercial ports, but for the interests of private marinas and private slips and docks. And so um, uh, that's an important issue too. And between the two ports, we had very different um, port structures. We had uh, some similarity in cargo types. Uh, and uh, as, as Gene points out, a, a very broad difference in terms of uh, dredging issues. Thank you. Uh, what was the interaction between you folks and the Corps of Engineers and the, the other, you know, other folks out there? I understand that the Corps is looking at trying to improve the environmental uh, uh, footprint or, or uh, of their breakwaters and some of these structures out there. Have you worked with them on on that, or how? Uh, we haven't on the environmental aspect yet. I am aware of the webinars that you're talking about. That is one of their their uh, their initiatives going on, but we work very closely with them on the infrastructure issues, on identifying the types of infrastructure that they have in place throughout the Great Lakes, as in it, especially the numbers that they were getting from their contractors to replace their infrastructure, because a lot of their infrastructure is, is 100 years old or so. And so we received great numbers from their projects. And then when we can, could combine those with what we were seeing from new projects being built by the private consultants, it made the matrix all that much better because it was all encompassing from older structures, older federal structures, to new private structures or slips being built. In addition to working with the Corps that direction, um, it really was advantageous to let them know what we were thinking because we could um, coordinate with them and normalize the dollars in this study to $2,010. We can do that again to $2,011, obviously. Um, but to also average over a decade of information. Uh, so it was really advantageous. I want to point out, too, that we, we also worked closely with Dr. Marvinine Delure from the St. Lawrence Seaway Development um, Corporation, and um, uh, she was instrumental in helping us uh, coordinate information related to um, searching out uh, literature, uh, both uh, gray literature and um, uh, peer-reviewed literature. And so we had a number of different groups. We also worked, obviously, with the port community very, very closely. We had a variety of people involved. So. Um, it worked out uh, very well, and we firmly believe that all of us are smarter than any of us. So That's for sure. Thanks, Dale. Um, what are the outcomes that you might be hoping for from these case studies, and how do you see uh, Great Lakes coastal communities using this information? Are they capable of collecting this information, or, or would uh, you know, Sea Grant or Corps engineers or somebody else have to help them with that? Well, we saw it certainly two initial of uh, issues to come, and that's to show the initial values of the structures and the initial values that the ports provide to the communities, and just the, the simple infrastructure cost numbers demonstrate a beginning 
of that, uh, not even including the structures on top of it. But it was also, on the flip side, it was meant to be an awareness issue, or not really a waking up issue, but an awareness of if these climate change impacts do indeed occur and either cause these types of damages or the dredging required, these are the types of costs that, that they're going to have to come up with, or someone's going to have to come up with. So it was kind of an awareness issue uh, that these climate change impacts can be serious and they can be very costly. Um, again, yeah, to reiterate, um, not only can they anticipate um, uh, potential costs and liabilities, but it gives them a point to focus around to discuss adaptation, climate adaptation. It really is hard to get these dialogues going within communities, and port communities um, in particular have this particular resource that is kind of hidden to them. Um, are, they op are they leveraging this resource appropriately? Do they understand uh, what it really could bring to their community? And the answer is generally no. I'm, um, we're probably, uh, in terms of transportation systems, the Great Lakes Maritime Transportation System is operating at maybe half capacity. Um, and yet, it's a great tool to use for climate mitigation. Um, it's much more environmentally friend friendly than rail or trucking. It's 10 times more efficient than t trucking and perhaps twice as uh, more pr uh, friendly to the environment than, uh, than rail. Um, and so I guess, you know, the bottom line is that um, we hope that people will use this tool not only to understand the costs, but to use it as a foci for getting together and um, developing uh, broader communication within the ports community. Frank, during our, some of our case study discussions, uh, we began to realize that many of the facility owners weren't looking very far ahead for potential damage or consequences due to climate change. I think the greatest we may have heard was five to ten years outlook. It's more of just the reaction mode. And so the, these numbers, though simplistic and just beginning to be quantifiable, were eye-openers to them. That maybe we do need to look ahead and pay attention because if these types of impacts were to occur, uh, we could be very surprised if we weren't looking ahead more than one or two years. Well, that leads us into this next question. Or, uh, kind of discuss, uh, with climate change in mind, uh, uh, would you uh, put on your crystal ball or, or uh, gazing hats and try to envision what you think the Great Lakes ports uh, or the Great Lakes might look like 50 years from now? Well, I think I think that um, you know that really is the modelers um, that that need to be making those uh, those conclusions. But the things that we hear are water levels are going to be different. Now we don't know if it's going to be up or down. We know that storm intensity and storm frequencies are likely to increase. And um, we know that precipitation events are going to create more erosion. Um, so again, that's why we need a scalable model, because we have a general notion of what the problems might be. But um, until we can get microclimate data that's dependable, uh, at least private industry won't invest in it. And quite frankly, I don't think local governments can afford to and then it falls on the federal government to make these large, uh, these large uh, infrastructure decisions. And so um, uh, if we're good at one thing in the Great Lakes, it's adaptation. And the maritime community in particular has been stellar at it, uh, having one of the most efficient fleets in the world doing what they do. But we could see new opportunities. One of the things that, that you have to realize is that as the climate changes, the way we go about our work will change. The tools we need to complete our tasks will change. And that's going to be very true within the maritime industry. And so the structure of ports could be modified um, because of both rising or, or falling uh, water levels. I, I would say my visions are that the more critical component are the dredging issues because we're right at those, those tipping points as we speak. Uh, it, it won't take much of a water level drop to cause an increase in dredging and a significance or significant increase in dredging. 
I do think the majority of the port structures uh, would need to, to take quite a beating other than the very old structures before you had to totally replace them. Uh, that's not really a realistic scenario that all of them would have to be replaced. Uh, there certainly could be some damage to some of the older structures, but I'll, I'll go back to my beginning statement and say that, that the sedimentation issue is probably going to be a bigger driver and a more, uh, more reality climate change impact to the Great Lakes than the infrastructure failure itself. And the, the, the next climate um, reality that we'd be dealing with on the Great Lakes that would ma have a major impact, of course, is ice in and ice out. That is, what date does the ice come on the lake and when does it leave the lake? And currently, you know, the fleet comes to a stop in mid-December and doesn't start again in, until uh, the 15th of March. Um, we could see thinner ice cover, um, so there might be year-round shipping on the Great Lakes. We might need an ice-hardened fleet. We could need a variety of different um, uh, tools to, to deal with that. We could have new opportunity. We could have liner service and container service, much, uh, much to the delight of the industry, I'm sure, and many of the communities. And so there are, like I said, both opportunities and threats that we have to deal with, and it's good to be prepared. Well, what's your, uh, uh, my understanding is that in the Dust Bowl era of the 1930s, uh, the lake levels were like three feet below the long-term average, and then with the high, record high lake levels in 1986, uh, uh, being three feet up or so above the long-term average, we have that six-foot uh, range. Does your matrix account for that, or can you account, is, is that the scalable, when you said scalable, will that deal with that? Those kinds of, those are kind of a natural occurrence, I guess, without before we even before we start talking about climate change. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the, the matrix is in the dredging tool portion is per foot of depth, so it's all relative to where we are now and what the sedimentation is for the structures. It would take that into account of when they would fail or when they would need to be replaced, and that's where you're working with the port communities, you would inspect each type of structure and see, because some structures can already take a uh, five foot increase, and others are right at the tipping point. So yes, they're flexible. Also, I'll point out that um, you know, you're talking about mean depth, for example, and then you're talking about absolute depth. And absolute depth, takes into account cyclical change, and that's how these, these facilities were originally constructed, looking backwards over 100 years. But now today, when you add on this unknown quantity, for example, we asked, we asked uh, the port community what would happen if you had a three-foot increase, and the immediate response was, no problem. Our, our dock faces can deal with a three-foot increase. And then we said, uh, are you thinking about seiches? And a seiche, of course, is when we have an, a, it's a unique Great Lakes, a fairly unique event to the Great Lakes, where you have uh, um, a pressure change, wind-driven uh, water that stacks up on one side of the lake. And you, in Lake Superior, that could be another three feet. So if the mean depth changes by three feet, you have to factor in also the three-foot seiche. In Lake Erie, I believe you know you're talking about 14 feet in a seiche event. So the vulnerability of systems um, due to the uniqueness of the environment uh, of the Great Lakes um, is certainly worth consideration and is, and is difficult to predict. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, well, another question. Uh, how can communities access the, or utilize this matrix? Uh, do you, can somebody just pick it up and run with it, or do, you, would it, do they need a consulting engineer, or, or maybe could a, you know, a, a local port authority is made up of volunteers to uh, uh, use this matrix? They would clearly need a consulting engineer to guide them through the use of it because of the assumptions involved. The matrix itself you know, will be part of the grant, grant product, but it's a methodology in how it's used. It could be easily misused uh, depending on the assumptions. So a port would utilize a coastal engineer or a maritime specialist with, with some engineering background to apply it. 
ultimately what we'd like to do is um, have each major port in particular do an assessment because we need to understand what are the assets in the Great Lakes in terms of the maritime transportation system. Um, it also works for the communities themselves. What are their current and future opportunities related to this form of transportation and how does it integrate with their uh, shoreside infrastructure? And then ultimately, again, this is a starting point as Gene clearly noted. Um, we're looking at vertical faces. The next step is to look at the horizontal faces, the laydown areas, the roads, the access points, the grain elevators, the uh, manufacturing facilities, the whatever it might be. And in the case of communities, that might include uh, everything from museums uh, like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame to uh, wastewater treatment systems. Um, what are the values of, of goods and services and buildings that are being protected by this very frontline resource, which is the vertical faces and, and protective structures of the Great Lakes. So if you want to see the full impact and the full range, this would have to be exploded and extrapolated. And again, what a great opportunity for a port community to come together, to bring all the different elements together and talk about what is our future. And that's what we're hoping this can do. And we're here to help. Thank you. Um, another question, that are more on the uh, connecting channels of the Great Lakes. Obviously, they are, they are uh, some of the limiting factors of moving from one lake to the other, uh, uh, shipping iron ore from the you know, upper Great Lakes down to the steel mills, things like that. Is it practical to change the uh, levels of those channels? Are they, uh, do you guys have any uh, knowledge about the, like the St. Mary's River or the Detroit River Channel, those kinds of sections where they have bottlenecks and, and are they built in stone? Do we have, would we have to go back and redo those things if we see dramatic change or lessening of, of uh, the lake levels? Or how would transportation adapt to a, a, a serious uh, decline in lake levels? Um, I think the good news is that, um, like I said, the maritime industry is, is uh, used to adaptation. And you can make it longer, you can make it wider, you can make it deeper. And you can still carry more volume. So there are ways to address changing um, levels. Uh, but the fleet that's constructed obviously has the parameters that it needs to deal with and they're not easily changed. The subject that you, the question you just asked sort of diverts from where we are here. Um, again, um, as maritime transportation is used for climate mitigation uh, because of its efficiencies, um, and it's better understood and better utilized by the communities that have access to this international resource, um, we're going to see a heightened awareness and a bigger push. Um, today, I think we're, we're truly trying to pull back and talk about the port communities and the interface at the community rather than the entire region. But um, we'll leave that, that direct answer to the core and to Marad. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, we're getting close to noon uh, or, or 1 o'clock. I want to thank again Dale uh, Bergeron and Gene Clark for their willingness to talk to us today about Great Lakes ports and their possible impacts with the changing climate. It's been an excellent discussion. I want to remind you all that our survey URL for this webinar is in the chat feature. Please take a few minutes to fill that out. I also want to mention that the uh, publication from their work as well as many others from the subjects and uh, speakers we've had before addressing climate change are located on our changingclimate.osu.edu website. And this includes archives of all the webinar presentations. Uh, uh, this one included will be up there in a week or two. This webinar series will continue next month with a presentation by Ohio State University's Dr. Stu Ludson, who will be discussing how climate change could affect our fish in the Great Lakes with the, the series continuing monthly through June. Thank you again to Dale and Jean and all participants in this webinar. We hope this was beneficial and hope you'll join us again in an upcoming webinar. Thank you and have a great afternoon.